Phil, thank you so much for being game for this because I mean you don't know what's going to happen. No, no, I don't. <laughs> he is uh, he is Doctor uh, Philip Calcott. He studied physics at, uh, at at Oxford and at Sheffield Universities. He worked for many years as a as a research scientist. He then um, I think met his South African wife uh, in the UK and um, and got dragged back with a smile back here. And um, as I think you've heard, he now lives in the Waterberg. One of the uh, things he's, he does, I'm not sure if it's, a, if it's more of a hobby or more of a job thing, but certainly a passion, is he does these amazing astronomy shows because there's, you know, there's a, um, just a, an amazing night sky where, where he lives and uh, just that opportunity for that. And uh, yeah, but uh, without much further ado, Phil, let's just um, dive into the session. Now, as we said, um, what, uh, what we'll do is we'll do uh, just a few minutes. I think uh, Phil has something lined up, 10 or 12 minutes in terms of a recent development. And I thought that was very interesting when you mentioned it to me, which is, um, so, uh, you know, we're playing in the space of what everything is made of. And just last week, there were some exciting developments in the realms of physics in terms of um, new, uh, new steps or new progress in terms of figuring all that out. Tell us what that's about, Phil. Yeah, yeah, very exciting um, potentially results from the 7th of April, just nine days ago. Um, as you said, dealing with this question that has intrigued humanity, certainly for thousands of years, back to the Greeks, of what is everything made of? If you could have sort of the ultimate microscope um, and you could take a substance and zoom in uh, as far as you wanted with as great a clarity as you wanted, what would you see? Um, so if you had a lump of gold, as you zoomed in, would it just look like gold all the way down? Or would you find it's actually made of sort of fundamental building blocks? And, and the Greeks speculated about this. Um, and of course, um, the start of the scientific revolution showed us that, yes, it was. It was made of these things called atoms. But then as we went into the, to the 20th century, we discovered heck atoms are made of stuff as well and in fact even the stuff that atoms are made of is made of stuff so you can kind of zoom in and in and in and the 20th century has really one of its great successes is to work out if you keep zooming in what are the fundamental building blocks out of which everything is made so we call these elementary particles um because basically they're the fundamental things that you cannot split down into anything smaller. Um, and one of the ways we've made great progress in finding out what these elementary particles are is we've smashed particles together at vast energies. Now, why that is helpful is when you do that, you create this sort of fireball of in intense energy. And I'm sure everyone's probably familiar with Einstein's famous equation e equals mc squared energy and matter are sort of interchangeable energy and mass so if you create intense energy in that fireball you can make new particles so doing this gradually physicists have discovered all sorts of exotic particles that we don't see in normal life but are there as fundamental particles out of which reality can be built things like chum quarks and tau leptons and all these weird things um, and we've built up this thing that you could call well it's called the standard model. And what it basically is, is a sort of zoo of all the elementary particles that we know of. And it's 17 particles, and it's been an incredibly successful model. It was really, these 17 particles were pretty much, apart from one, all discovered by the 1970s. Um, but there was a problem. We knew, however wonderful the standard model was, it wasn't the whole story, it was incomplete. We knew there must be other things going on, partly because, for example, some of you have probably heard of dark matter, that doesn't appear in the standard model at all. So that's that's somewhere else. We don't know what that is. Um, there were these things called um, neutrinos you might have heard of, which in the standard model should have no mass, but they had mass. We've discovered they've got mass. So there were all these problems. Gravity wasn't explained within the standard model. The asymmetry of matter and antimatter in the universe wasn't explained in the standard model. So for a long time, physicists have regarded the, the standard model as a useful approximation that is going to be swept away. And they've always been expecting it to be swept away for the last 50 years. 
and they haven't been able to do that. They haven't been able to break the standard model. That's elementary particle physicists' goal. And one of their major efforts to break this, you probably will have heard of, um, it's the creation of the biggest particle smasher in the world called the Large Hadron Collider. So this thing is 27 kilometers in circumference and it smashes protons and antiprotons together at the highest energies we can achieve on Earth so far, 14 tera electron volts, if you want to know the numbers. And everybody, when they uh, built the Large Hadron Collider, all the hundreds and hundreds of physicists involved in this incredible project, it's the biggest machine humans have ever made and one of the most complicated. The reason they were doing it was to break the standard model, to find out where the extra particles at high energy. You see, to create a particle, you have to put enough energy in to sort of make its mass. And so the extra energy of the Large Hadron Collider would enable them to make heavier particles than existed in the standard model. And the majority of physicists, some of them were very, very sure that new particles would be discovered. And to everyone's massive distress, they weren't. Um, there were all sorts of bets that had to be paid off by physicists who'd, who'd bet that these, these and these particles would be discovered by this date, and they weren't. So it's, it's created a great depression, actually, across the whole um, <clears throat> discipline of particle physics, and um, much weeping and gnashing of teeth, really. But thankfully, it is not the end of the story. There is another way of detecting extra particles that we don't have enough energy to create. We might need a bigger collider, um, but we could detect them by this method. Just to deal with the, the bigger collider question, um, how much bigger will we need to go to be sure we were gonna create extra particles? Well, physicists know that if we made a particle smasher that is 1000 trillion times as energetic as the Large Hadron Collider, we'd be sure to create extra particles then. But um, as you can imagine, 1,000 trillion times bigger is a little bit of a problem. It would make it the size of our galaxy, which is um, a little bit out of reach at the moment. So we've got to look at another way. Unfortunately, physicists are quite inventive. And, and there is another way to detect the presence of extra particles, um, extra fundamental particles. Now, it's got to do with something called the quantum vacuum, which I'm afraid I'm going to have to go into. So in a classical vacuum, if you imagine you suck everything out of a region of space, then it has nothing in it, you know, obviously vacuum, except with quantum mechanics, it doesn't work like that. Because of the zero point energy in quantum fields, if you want to go into the gory details, or a simpler way you can look at it, the uncertainty principle, even if you suck everything out of a vacuum, the uncertainty principle still says, well, wait a sec, um, there's a certain uncertainty um, in the fields associated with every single particle. And what that means is virtual particles of every sort that exists can very, very, very temporarily pop into existence and then pop out of existence again. So what this means is a, a vacuum in reality, and this has been tested and this is real, is not a vacuum. It's actually a seething foam of all these virtual particles popping in and out of existence. And if you zoom down in energy, you'll see the effects of all these virtual particles popping in and out of existence. And in particular, if you take a real particle that doesn't pop in and out of existence, it kind of stays there, and you put it in this quantum vacuum, which of course everything is the quantum vacuum, it will be surrounded by this cloud of virtual particles. And this cloud of virtual particles will affect the properties you can measure of this particle. So you can probably see where this is going. So if we could do an experiment in which we could measure the effect of all these virtual particles on a real particle with incredible accuracy, and then if we calculated the effect of all the virtual particles of all the particles we know of so far, and if there was a discrepancy between what we measure and what we calculated, what that would mean is there were some extra particles that we did not yet know of that were contributing to this sort of foam of virtual particles affecting the real particle. I hope that makes sense. And that is exactly what they did on the 7th of April. Well, yeah, 
not exactly on the 7th of April. They've st they started this program over 20 years ago. Um, and everything about this program, I would describe as heroic because it's incredibly hard. What they're doing is measuring a property called the magnetic moment of a particle called the muon. And because for various reasons, it's the most sensitive particle we can access to the existence of these virtual particles. But there are problems. So the first problem you've got is the muon is kind of a cousin of the electron, heavier, that's why they actually want it because the mass helps you detect the presence of virtual particles, but it only exists for a millionth of a second. <laughs> so you have to create them, do your experiment in a millionth of a second uh, and get your results. So that's a bit challenging to start off with. But secondly, you have to create a staggeringly well designed and uniform experiment. And in this experiment, what you're doing is you're whizzing muons around a circular magnet, 50 meters in diameter. And this magnet has to be staggeringly powerful and incredibly smooth. It mustn't have any blips or wrinkles in it because that would mess up the, the detail and the errors on your measurement. Um, such a magnet was created with great effort at Brookhaven Laboratory in New York. And they had a source of muons, a particle accelerator that could produce muons. They piled their muons into the ring. They measured this thing called the magnetic moment. And they found that at the level of billionths of the magnetic moments, moments value, there was indeed a discrepancy seemed to appear between what they measured and what should be the value given all the particles we're aware of and hence evidence for new particles that we were not aware of. The problem was their muon source wasn't really strong enough. And in fact, their magnet actually needed a few tweaks to make it better as well. But particularly the muon source wasn't strong enough. Uh, they didn't have enough new muons. Now, um, so it's kind of exciting result, but it wasn't conclusive. There was still, there was like one in 10,000 chance it could just be a fluke. And physicists don't like that. They like to go to the level of one in three million. And then they said, yeah, we've got it. That, that's, that's a real result. They call it the five sigma level. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is where it gets truly heroic. So they, they looked across the United States and in Fermilab in Chicago, there was a much stronger muon source. And so it was like, okay, here we've got the magnet, here we've got the muon source. Uh, do we bring Mohammed to the mountain or the mountain to Mohammed kind of thing? And they concluded the obvious thing was to bring the magnet to the muon source. Now, this thing is massive, incredibly delicate because of this uniformity of the magnetic field. You can't twist it, bend it, do anything to it. It's got to be kept exactly as it is. And they transported this magnet 5,000 kilometers to Fermilab. So they put it on a ship down the east coast of the United States. They took it into the Gulf of Mexico. They took it up the Mississippi River. Then they transported overland to another river and took it up another river. And then they had to transport this thing over a bit of road. And the only way they could do it was at night by closing down the entire road and slowly, slowly on this trailer, very carefully taking it inch by inch to Fermilab. They did all of this and set it up in 2013 in Fermilab with a much more powerful set of muons and they made a better, more uniform magnetic field. And they've done the experiment again and they've got the first batch of data. And to everyone's excitement, it confirms the result that they made 20 years ago at Brookhaven, that there really looks like a difference between the experimental and the theoretical measure of the muons magnetic moment, which really might well be explained by the presence of extra particles beyond the standard model. Now, I should just give the theoreticians a call out here as well, because the theory side of this is also heroic. So we've had over a hundred physicists, top theoretical physicists working for many years to do the theory calculations. They're incredibly complex and there's actually an infinite number of them, <laughs> which, is, which is nasty. But what they do is they take the, the most important ones and, and gradually go to least and least until important ones until they think they've got enough accuracy. And so to do this calculation, they did 15,000 calculations to get this result, which I think is pretty heroic as well. So it's been a major act of heroism really on the part of physicists. And the result is tremendously exciting. It seems to confirm this difference between the experimental result and the theoretical result that seems to suggest 
there might be new particles that we have not yet seen. And that's going to inspire physicists to, you know, not cry into their coffee every morning, but to perk up and think, wow, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel sort of thing. Yeah, so that, that result was announced on the 7th of April. And, and you can really say, in some ways, it's the most exciting result in elementary particle physics in the last 50 years, because it's the first pretty solid result that seems to break this half century old standard model that we know needs to be broken. So physicists are happy. And hopefully it's going to tell us, gradually, it'll be a building block that will tell us more about what everything is made of. There you go, Torsten. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Okay, I mean, lots of questions. Um, in the teaser, you gave us a sort of the figure of 2.000 something. Just connect that. Yeah, so, so um, muons have this thing called a magnetic moment, which is like a little magnet inside the tiny elementary particle. And um, you can see the effect of this by making it interact with the magnetic field. And if you ignore all the effects, of these virtual particles, that number should be two, exactly two. But of course there are virtual particles. Uh, if, you, if you add in the virtual particles we know of, it produces a difference of about 0.1 of a percent in that value. So it's like 2.0013384181, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but by the time you get to the 11th decimal place in that two, that's where the theoretical result diverges from the experimental result we actually got. So they measured it with that accuracy, which is quite stunning. Um, and so at that level, we start to see, whoa, um, this is where it looks like extra, extra virtual particles that we don't know about are making a contribution. So they talk about the anomalous muon magnetic moments, or they talk about G minus two. So, you know, G would be two, but it's, if, if there weren't any virtual particles, it's slightly more than two. So if you take off the two, you get left with the effect of the virtual particles. Um, so that it's, that's why it's called the muon G minus two experiment. And um, perhaps one more before we open it up to the general Q and A is, um, so I'm going, this is, this is great. We now know there's something more out there that we haven't discovered yet but we have no clue what that might look like or where to find it or uh, um, what its properties might be. Uh, what, what's the next step? Where are we going? So there's two next steps and they're both happening at the same time, really, or even three, you could say. So the one thing that I know will be happening in abundance is theoreticians who've been starved of any data for the last certainly two decades, they will be going nuts. And so there'll be a massive swarm of new papers saying i know i know this this the new particles are my particular favorite model of particles that might exist there's some kind of exotic particle and this that and the other so all these papers will be pouring out onto the preprint servers trying to explain the result um so that's that's and most of them of course will be wrong <laughs> if not all of them but uh, that will be quite exciting but the sort of hard slog that will be going on as well is this is just the start of the experimental work. So physicists at, at Fermilab in Chicago have collected just 6% of the data they intend to collect. So as they get more data, they'll be able to narrow down the uncertainty in their value so that the experimental result will become more certain. Theoreticians will also be putting in extra blood, sweat and tears on their side as well, because there's no that I haven't mentioned that bizarre as it may seem, on the day the experimental results were launched, there was a sort of rogue theoretical group called the BMW group, after the initials of the cities their universities are in. They published a result saying, no, 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 the standard theory group's results is wrong. We've, we've done it, this experiment, the theory calculation a different way, and we disagree with the theory group. So there's actually a little bit of controversy about how we should calculate the, the existence, the, the effect of all the virtual particles we know of on the muon magnetic moment. Um, so that needs to be sorted out and the experimental data needs to get firmer. And sadly, that's going to take years on both sides. Um, but it's like a crack in the door has been opened to the brave new world of new physics. Um, 
And if nothing else, it's given those poor elementary particle physics hope, particle physicists hope rather. So yeah, and I mean, there's discussions about building a new particle collider. Um, this one is not gonna be 27 kilometers in diameter. It's gonna be over a hundred kilometers, sorry, in circumference, which is just, you know, getting a little bit silly almost. And it's going to cost something like 20 billion euros or something. Um, it's prob this result has probably given more power to the elbow of those physicists wanting to build that because it might come out of the measurements that, whoa, these virtual particles exist and they're just within our grasp. If we can up the energy by a factor of 10 or something, we really should be able to see them. And then that will provide extra motivation for the politicians to open their purses or sorry, our purses, um, and pour more money into building a bigger uh, particle accelerator. So that's kind of what probably will happen in the future. Thank you, Phil. Um, let's open it up to a, to a general uh, Q&A. So basically, your question does not in any way need to be related to what uh, Phil was sharing. It can if you want, but you can really ask uh, um, any uh, question that plays somewhere in the realm of science or somewhere, uh, you know, a question where you have a hope that science might be able to answer it in some way. I think um, you know the rope. So basically, uh, if you unmute yourself, I can see you and give you a turn or use the raise hand feature. If it helps you formulate your question, you could also put it in the chat. Thanks, Phil. So just staying on this topic for a moment, um, could you clarify again what you mean by virtual particles or those particles that pop in and out of existence, as you say, and do they have some kind of existence within the quantum field? Um, and, you know, how, what is a helpful way of thinking about possible higher dimensions being involved here, as it were, you know, particles sort of moving between dimensions in such a way that we can only observe them at certain times? Because I guess this is where, where magical thinking can also start coming in and people start thinking this is maybe where there's a gap for miracles or something like that. But what's a helpful way of thinking about that? Very good question. Thank you. Yes, um, I don't think it really relates to extra dimensions at all. What it does relate to um, is quantum field theory. So um, I've talked about this mostly in terms of sort of basic quantum mechanics, but quantum theoreticians uh, like going a bit deeper into something they call quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, every single thing that we think of as a particle is actually a quantum of excitation of a quantum field. So let's take our electron. We think of electron as a little particle whizzing around. In quantum field theory, what it is, is there is an electron, not an electric, an electron, field that pervades the entire universe and what an electron is is a wiggle in that quantum field so i don't know if any of you've seen uh, that thing i call the slinky like you know those those fancy long spring coil things and you can sort of hold one end and your friend can hold another end and you can kind of flick it and you can see that sort of um that excitation of the spring that little um wobble going along, traveling along the spring, hitting the, your friend at the end and sort of traveling back to you. And it's almost as if it has an existence of its own. And that's a reasonable analogy for how quantum field theory sees particles. So your electron is an excitation in this underlying quantum field, in this underlying electron quantum field. And that's true about all the fundamental particles. So there's actually all these insane quantum fields pervading the whole of space, um, but normally we don't really see them because we only see them when there's excitations, except quantum theory says that um, every field has a zero point energy associated with it. So again, this is where the quantum vacuum comes in. Um, there's no such thing as a quantum field with no energy, absolutely zero energy associated with it. And what virtual particles really are, are sort of fluctuations in the quantum field that don't rise to the level of being real particles, but there's still little wiggles in that, for example, take the electron quantum field, there'd be little wiggles in the electron quantum field that can still have effects 
on real particles around them. Now, physicists like to call these virtual particles because it's easier for the public to think of that. But a lot of theoreticians tear their hair out at that and say, no, 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 that's a bad way of describing it. These things are not virtual particles. They are fluctuations in the underlying quantum field. That's sort of, you can think of as the uncertainty principle, the zero point energy of the field. The, these are inevitable results of the nature of the quantum field. So every quantum field will have these, and you can, if you like, talk about them as virtual particles, but they're not really. They're really just fluctuations in the underlying quantum fields. I don't know if that helps. It does. Um, if I can ask a sort of short follow-up. Um, so where does a quantum field start and where does it end? I mean, it seems like th that is kind of a unit in itself. It pervades the whole of the universe. Every one of them pervades the whole of the universe. Everywhere where there's space-time, which is everywhere, there's, there's quantum fields. And it might be worth mentioning there's one particularly important quantum field that you might have heard of called the Higgs field. So the Higgs field, the Higgs was the last of the standard model particles to be discovered. Um, we knew it had to exist because it's a very, very special particle associated with a special field and unique amongst all the quantum fields the Higgs field has a non-zero value everywhere. So uh, in a quantum vacuum, it's not just the fluctuations of the Higgs field that exist. The actual field itself has a certain value. And it's that effect, that, that property of the Higgs field that allows it to interact with all the other particles of the elementary particle zoo and gives them this rather useful property that we call mass. So you might have heard of that, how the Higgs field is the mechanism by which mass um, is created in all the other fundamental particles. So it's a weird concept that all these quantum fields are pervading everywhere and we're kind of not noticing them most of the time, but it seems to work. So physicists like it. Well, I'm trying to get to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, Cheryl asks, why do we need to know what everything is made of? So I think that's a good question. The stuff, I bother. Yeah, no, I mean, you could, could make an argument that we don't, but um, I would make two arguments in response to that. One is by finding out what everything's made of, we have actually created some wonderful technological advances. So for example, I don't know whether any of you experienced positron electron tomography. It's a very useful imaging technique in medical science and it uses positrons which are you know something that maybe we don't come across in normal life and and came out of the study of the elementary particle zoo in one sense uh, there's possible uses for muons um which again don't exist normally they have to be created in this kind of, so our knowledge of the fundamental particle zoo um has already had some technological uses and there's good reason to think that it might have more uses as we go further. Um, neutrinos, neutrinos are incredibly useful. Really? Yes, really, because there's this amazing experiment called ICE, which is a neutrino telescope through which we're able to view some of the most energetic events in the universe. Uh, it's built in the Antarctic. Don't get me going on about it. I, I'll get overexcited. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so that's one thing. I think that there are uses of elementary particles and understanding them. Secondly, I think there's also a cultural value in understanding the way the universe is. You know, why do we do astronomy? Why do we want to work out what's going on in galaxies billions of light years away? I think it's because as human beings, we're curious. We're inherently curious about the way the world is. And that's part of what makes it exciting to be a human and doing this work to find out how things are and how the universe is put together. This is fundamentally exciting and of sort of cultural value for the whole human race. So I think you can justify it on that level alone, um, but you can also justify it with technological spin-offs. I just wanted to ask about uh, grav gravitational fields, if you can explain that, of yeah. gravitational waves. Oh, gravitational waves. Okay, yes. so, um, yeah, two slightly different things. So, I mean, gravity is the fourth force in nature. The four forces, the strong nuclear, weak nuclear, the electromagnetic, and the gravitational. And of all of them, actually, the gravitational force is in some ways the most mysterious. Um, it doesn't 
we haven't been able to quantize it yet. So every other force has been subjected to quantum mechanics and we've produced a sort of um, quantized theory of the force. Um, but gravity resists quantization. When people try and do it, things blow up and explode to infinity and go nasty. And it's, it's the greatest possibly unsolved problem in physics. Um, <clears throat> so it's described by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, and this is where gravitational waves come in. I will get there. But the thing about Einstein's general theory of relativity is it is a classical theory. It has not been quantized. So um, it does things that quantum mechanics kind of says you can't. And there's a, it's perhaps the biggest tension in the whole of physics is these are the two most fundamental theories we have, quantum mechanics and the general theory of relativity. And they're kind of at war particularly when it comes to black holes, which is another subject, but gravitational waves. So what it basically, Einstein's general theory of relativity says, space time can be bent, which is kind of weird. So matter and energy distort space time. You can almost imagine it on a two dimensional level as a kind of rubber membrane and every sort of source of mass or energy is like hanging a weight underneath the rubber membrane, so it pulls it down. And this, so matter and energy bend space-time, and then space-time tells objects how to move. So if you imagine rolling a marble near a sort of bendy bit on that rubber membrane, it would be sort of pulled in by the curvature of the rubber membrane, sort of do a sort of deviation around it. And that's basically what Einstein says gravity is. Now, gravitational waves come in, because you can dynamically distort that membrane. So you can kind of wobble it in real time. And one of the best ways to wobble it is actually to get two black holes to collide and merge. So they start whizzing around each other incredibly fast and crash, bang. Um, and if you do that, the gravitational forces are so intense and they're dynamic, they're moving, they're changing, that they create ripples in the fabric of space time. And that's what gravitational waves are. They're ripples in the fabric of space time, which go out billions of light years. And LIGO, this another absolutely heroic experiment in the States, these two gravitational wave detectors that work together, they have detected these gravitational waves, these fluctuations in um, ripples in space time. And to do so, they are the most accurate um, experiment there is that we've ever made. Just to give you an example, um, Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us. It's 40 trillion kilometers away, which is a fair distance. If you were to fly there at the speed of a jumbo jet, it would take you five and a half million years to get there. So it's quite a long way away. Um, LIGO measures the length of its cavity that it uses to detect gravitational waves. It measures them with the precision you would get if you measured the distance to Alpha Centauri, 40 trillion kilometers, to the accuracy of the diameter of a human hair. Just think about that. Quite staggering. A sensitivity of 10 to the power 23. One in 10 to the power 23. Anyway, that was probably more information than you wanted, but that's what gravitational waves are. And it's another heroic physics experiment that we've been able to measure these things, which were postulated 100 years ago by Einstein to exist. Claude is, uh, is saying what IQ is needed to be accepted into particle physics research. So um, just to maybe, uh, I don't know, give permission to ask questions that don't need to be quite as, uh, as in-depth. Let me, if I may, I'm just going to jump in and ask you one, uh, Phil. Um, why is the sky blue? All right. <laughs> uh, it, I sort of go, why is it not sun color? It, did it need to turn out blue and not green? And then the ocean's also blue, and is that connected in some way? I'm mm. sure there's a physics answer for that. That's a good question. Um, interesting enough, a lot of people feel they, those two effects are connected, but they're not. And you can kind of see why they're not. If you have an indoor swimming pool that doesn't see the sky, a white tiled swimming pool, and look into it, if it's deep enough, it will still look blue. So what you're seeing there is why the sea looks blue and why water looks blue in general, sometimes with a greeny tint. But what's going on basically is take the swimming pool example. Um, you're looking through the water at the white bottom of the swimming pool. And so what's happening is light is coming in, going through the water, hitting the bottom and coming out through the water again. So it's 
the key thing is it's passing through quite a bit of water. And in water, the red part of the spectrum, the red part of the rainbow, if you'd like to call it that way, gets absorbed more than the blue part of the rainbow. So that's why it looks blue, because the red has kind of been sucked out of the light. That's why if you ever see pictures of any kind of depth underwater, particularly the deep dive stuff, that the light is this murky blue, because all the red has been absorbed. Um, that's actually why in your swim pool, um, if you just have an open swim pool, half the sun's energy will always get absorbed in your swim pool, and it's the red end. The challenge is to get the blue end absorbed as well to heat your swim pool up a bit more. Um, okay, so that's 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 why the sea is blue and why streams are blue and swim pools are blue. Why the sky is blue is something completely different. Um, it's something called Rayleigh scattering after Lord Rayleigh um, or Raleigh, and what it is basically is he's a very clever dude, and he worked out that light, when it interacts with things smaller than light, um, it gets scattered very, very slightly. So it kind of get ba gets bounced out of the direction it was traveling in. Um, and that bouncing depends on the wavelength of light. And for blue light, that bouncing is much stronger. In fact, it, it goes as one over the wavelength to the fourth power, if you want to know the mathematical terms involved. So what that means is as you shine light through a gas like our atmosphere, the blue end of the, of the rainbow will be scattered more than the red end of the, of the rainbow. Now, when you're looking up at the sky, what you're actually looking at is light that's come from the sun and you're looking at the bit that's been scattered. You're only gonna see it if that light has effectively bounced off its direction of travel and come down to your eyeball, otherwise it would just go straight through the atmosphere. So you preferentially see the blue end of the rainbow because atmosphere, the gas of the atmosphere scatters blue more strongly than red. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the sun as it's setting, which you have to be careful, for, careful of, of course, um, that looks red for exactly the same reason. The blue part, has been scattered out of the sunlight. So you can get these beautiful red orbs of sunlight, particularly when there's extra, more dust in the atmosphere that provides more scattering of the blue out. So the blue gets kind of, you know, shoots off to the side and it's the red bit that comes through to see to, the, you, to your eye. And in the same way, when you look up at the sky, it's the blue bit that got scattered off to the side that you see. So there is an absolute parallel being red suns between red sunsets and blue sky but not between blue sky and blue sea. So I'll continue with the chat questions. The question around, you know, where are we basically with uh, nuclear fusions and uh, specifically with the controls of fusion power? Wow. Now that, that's a very topical and interesting question. It, it might be one for a, a future topical chat, uh, Torsten, because um, we've actually seen uh, an extraordinary period of investment and growth in nuclear fusion. So I just should explain what nuclear fusion is. Nuclear fusion, uh, we know it works because it happens in the sun. So basically there are two ways of getting nuclear energy out of elements. You can either take very, very big elements like, like uranium that has 235 nucleons, 92 protons and the rest neutrons. And if you split that apart, energy is released. Alternatively, you can take the lightest elements like hydrogen, just one proton. And if you stick two of those together, also energy is released. Now, we know all about nuclear fusion. Our standard nuclear power plants do that. Tragically, nuclear weapons do that as well. Um, but nuclear fusion offers amazing potential for almost unlimited clean energy because um, there's lots and lots of hydrogen around. Water is H2O. Um, and the products of the nuclear fusion are not in that of themselves radioactive. So in principle, if we could recreate the position in the sun that goes on at the center of the sun, we've got a source of massive amounts of energy. Um, now, the sun has an advantage. Um, it's 10 to the power 30 kilograms in mass. So it produces staggering pressures and temperatures at its center. So the temperature at the center of the sun is 15 million degrees Kelvin, which is fairly hot. And the pressure is about 3 billion times atmospheric pressure. 
So that's three billion bar. You know, when you pump your tires, you say, how, how much on your tire, sir? 2.4 bar, please. You know, how much on your tire? Three billion bar, please. It, it's insane. And when you get these insane pressures and temperatures, hydrogen, the nuclei of hydrogen protons are forced to smash into each other and fuse occasionally. And that is what produces the energy in the sun. Now, we would like to reproduce that in a laboratory. This is really, really hard the, because you've got to squash the hydrogen together really tight and you've got to heat it really, really hot, like really hot, because we don't can't create the densities in the sun. We have to go to higher temperatures. So typically, rather than 15 million degrees Kelvin, we're going to 100 million degrees Kelvin, which is challenging. Um, there's not many materials that can survive a, a gas at 100 million degrees Kelvin. In fact, there aren't any, of course. So the only way to contain it is actually using magnetic fields. So most of these devices, if not all of them, rely on using magnetic fields to squash your hydrogen together tight and use some other method to heat it. And hopefully you get fusion taking place. Um, and yeah, recently there have been lots and lots of startups in the States who've all got new ideas for how to do this. And they vary tremendously um, in the way they're trying to do it. And just recently, some results from some of the startups have come through that really seem quite promising. Um, a lot of them are funded by the big tech billionaires like Bill Gates and uh, people from Google and whatever. Uh, and they believe that this is the way forward for clean energy. So watch this space. I think going forward, um, it's highly possible that one of these startups is going to crack it uh, and going to be able to create a a realistic financially viable commercial fusion reactor which would kind of transform the whole energy um future of humanity really hi um so my hi. question is about um how we can uh, how is it possible for us to hear very low frequency sounds from very very small speakers it seems like we can hear them but it seems like the speakers I believe are not big, not big enough to actually produce those sounds. Yeah, um, well, I think there's a number of elements there. Um, kind of the lowest frequency that your speaker can support um, would normally be, well, the, low, the, the longest wavelength, which would correspond to the lowest frequency, would be one where half a wavelength equaled one of the dimensions of your speakers. So if you imagine like a, a sort of plucked guitar string, the fundamental harmonic is where the whole thing goes whoa, 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 up and down together. Um, and if you imagine your sound wave like a, a vibrating guitar string across your speaker, um, the length of that of the speaker determines half of the wavelength of the lowest frequency your speaker can, can, can produce, sort of. Now, there are tricks to enhance it. So one of the, those tricks is what they call porting. So what they do, and you may notice this on some of your speakers, they've got a hole at the back. You think, what's that doing? What that's about is that doubles the wavelength you can handle. Because instead of having to have a node, a sort of zero point of oscillation at each side of your speaker, at the port, you've got open space. So you can have an anti-node where the, where the wave of, of uh, sound are wobbling up and down. And this means the lowest wavelength is effectively double what you'd normally have without a ported speaker. I don't know if that makes sense. So if you imagine your guitar string, it's like your box is now halfway along the guitar string. The one side of your box, the ported side, corresponds to where the guitar string is going up and down frantically. So that's the first way they do it. Um, and the second way is it's not an absolute rule. You can actually create to a certain extent free, uh, wavelengths that are even longer than that. It's just the efficiency with which you create them drops off. So I think that basically explains it. You'll still get some level of base, even below the lowest wavelength, the longest wavelength that you can create. Um, and also the human ear is, has, a, has a low long wavelength cutoff. So um, we, you know, we're not so sensitive once the, the wavelength goes beyond a certain level. We're not elephants who can kind of pick up these infrasound uh, waves. So I think those, are the, those are the, that's the trick that speaker designers use. Um, and that kind of explains why surprising bass sounds come out of tiny speakers. Okay.
there are some questions that perhaps uh, step beyond the realm of, uh, of physics and uh, almost take us outside of the physics box and have, a, have us look at it from the outside. So uh, one would be, how would you answer the question, <clears throat> what is man's purpose on earth? Uh, this talk makes me think that the purpose is to discover more and more of the awesome creation. Okay, so you can see this is a um, question that is hard to pull you into the space of science and religion. You want to go there a moment? I'm very happy to go there. Um, I mean, fundamentally, I would go with the Westminster Catechism, you know, that the purpose of man is to know God and enjoy him forever. And I think that's the ultimate answer here. Um, I think part of that is enjoying the splendor of his creation. I mean, I get a huge kick every single time I, I see a moonless night with the Milky Way arching across the sky. I get a huge kick every time I see the Magellanic clouds. Um, I get a kick every time I look at the constellations, you know? So um, I think enjoying God's creation is something he intended. Uh, it, the Psalmist is very clear that, you know, it displays God's glory. Um, it's his handiwork and, and we are to enjoy it um and i suppose use it as uh a sort of a starting point for a praise and worship of him um and yeah i think it's a really good question because if we take it out wider a bit i think most of us would agree that we live in an increasingly materialistic world where everyone has more stuff and yet everyone is less happy and satisfied and and the reason is very simple is Life is not about getting more stuff. That's not what satisfies us. Um, and the Bible is very clear, you know, he who desires gold will not be satisfied by gold and he who desires silver will not be satisfi satisfied by silver. So getting more and more stuff is not the purpose of life. I remember seeing a cartoon um, of a funeral where some very rich man had obviously died and one person was whispering to another and they said, how much did he leave behind? And the other person says, oh, all of it. Yeah, you know, um, you can't take any of it with you. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm diverging. But yeah, absolutely. I think we made for a relationship with God. And part of that is to enjoy his handiwork. And that's, yeah, it's part of life to all its fullness that uh, Christ said we were to enjoy through him. Thank you, Phil. Um, Marty. How's it? I just, I just wanted to add on. I mean, you said you get a kick out of seeing seeing it, but there's there's like almost two components of it. There's a seeing it and not understanding it, and you still get an amazing kick. And then there's seeing it and understanding this much of it, and your brain has exploded, and you still get that massive kick. And then being an astrophysicist, and you still and I think that's the that's the thing. If you've got the faith and you understand and you accept that God created everything. And that we aren't ever going to understand all of it. Uh, I, I'm not trying to disrespect scientists or anything like oh, that, yeah. but Absolutely. often trying to explain everything of God in science makes you almost become uh, where, where you feel that you can replace God because you can understand him. And that, that, the Bible t speaks about mysteries of God that we're never going to understand. No, I'm in complete agreement with that, Marty, and complete agreement. I mean, I think if, in you know, Psalm 19, David looks up at the skies and says, wow, you know, and he doesn't know what he's looking at, but he gets, he gets it. He gets the glory of God through that. And I think the more you know, um, just the more glory you see. And I think you're absolutely right. Scientists can absolutely become arrogant um, and can uh, misunderstand their understanding of the way God does things as an explanation of why those things are there in the first place, which science does not provide. Science is descriptive. You know, why is there electrical charge? We don't know. That's the way God made it. Why is there the strong nuclear force? We don't know. That's the way God made it. As scientists, we're just seeing, we're just describing what's out there. Um, Kepler famously said, I am just thinking God's thoughts after him, which I thought was a nice way of putting it. Um, so I think because it's so exciting, uh, scientists can get arrogant and can think, wow, you know, I've sorted it all out. They haven't. They've just described it. Uh, they've dealt with the how it all works and not with the who made it and the why it was made in the first place. Yuri, you had a question earlier. Do you want to ask it? 
Ja, thanks, Thorsten. Um, Philip, a uh, stupid Afrikaans dominee finds all of this very fascinating, but also hard to understand. Okay. This study that you were discussing with us about going deeper and deeper to the microcosmos yes. is the opposite end of that. The whole idea of the possibility of a multiverse. <laughs> is there any relationship between the two? Wow. So, yeah, the multiverse. Now, um, this is a big and controversial subject in physics, and they are related. Um, the multiverse basically comes out of, or the idea for it, comes out of the synergy of two, one slightly controversial and one highly controversial theory in physics. So you might have heard of them. Uh, there's a theory called inflation, um, and there's a theory called string theory. Now, inflation is kind of generally accepted, though some people have problems with it. Um, and that says basically very, very early in the universe's existence uh, underwent this period of massive exponential expansion. Um, in a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, it exploded to vast size. Uh, and I won't go into the gory details, but this has certain implications about what might be going on in the universe now. Um, and the second part of the multiverse actually is string theory. So string theory is a very, very controversial theory that I would say physicists are more and more getting dissatisfied with it for a number of reasons. The first is it has miserably failed to provide any experimentally ver verifiable results. The second is you constantly have to tweak it to make it fit what we actually know. So for example, in, in physics, in the general theory of relativity, there are two types of space. There's de Sitter space and there's anti de Sitter space. And string theory works in anti de Sitter space, but we live in de Sitter space. And string theorists just say, oh, don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'm sure it works in de Sitter space as well. Um, but like kind of, heck guys, why are you working on a theory that actually doesn't seem to apply to the universe we live in? Um, so, and there's lots and lots of examples that string, make string theory a nice mathematical abstraction but not a good physical theory. And a lot of people get upset with that. But one of the aspects of string theory is it naturally works in 10 spatial dimensions. So to, in fact, it requires 10 spatial dimensions. Now, you might think that makes it a non-starter straight away because we know we have three sp spatial dimensions, you know, forwards, backwards, left, right, up and down. String theory says, no, 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 we've actually got 10. You just don't see seven of them. <laughs> now, <laughs> they're rolled up really small so you don't encounter them in daily life. Now that kind of blows my mind, that concept. Um, but it turns out, this is where the multiverse, I am getting there. It turns out there are many, many un huge, vast, at least 10 to the power 500, which is a big number, ways of rolling up these extra dimensions so we don't see them. And this is where the multiverse comes in. These different possibilities of what they call compactification could lead to, in principle, to different sorts of universes that basically constitute the multiverse. Now, as you can see, there's a staggering amount of supposition and very, very controversial ideas involved in that. And it might be a time for another, talk, a, a different talk about how that all works out and why people don't like it. Um, but suffice it to say, it's highly controversial um, and I think highly dodgy, um, but that is the basic idea behind, behind the multiverse. The string theory rolls up in different ways, these dimensions in different ways, and that produces a multitude of universes of which we live in just one. The one, I mean, there's there's others. Apologies if I don't get to everything. The one that I suppose really tickles me is uh, what are your thoughts on the idea that we live inside of a simulation? So basically prove to us we're not in the matrix. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the simulation idea um, is a little bit different to the matrix idea. I think the matrix idea is something's plugged into our neurons. You know, we're real physical beings. Something's plugged into our brain and tricking us. But the simulation idea is, is like a bit more radical. It's like, you know, if you, if you see a computer uh, game, we're one of the characters in the computer game is the simulation idea. Um, and to be honest, I find it quite extraordinary because you'll hear quite respected physicists, really quite happy with the idea we're inside a simulation. Now, what does that imply? So what it means is 
there's some very, very advanced intelligence with massive computing facilities that we can't even imagine that is running this insanely complicated program that we are, that is us basically. Um, and people are quite happy with that, who are not happy with the idea of a God who created our universe. No, 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 but they're happy with the idea of this uber intelligence who do to this, but wait a sec, but who made the stuff out of which this uber intelligence are made of? It doesn't answer that question at all. It doesn't answer the fundamental question. Um, so maybe they are inside a simulation made by another extra uber uber intelligence. So, and, and you can see you've got an infinite regress of super intelligences. And um, it does puzzle me why people even entertain this idea in some ways. Um, plus there are serious practical difficulties. A little bit of thought about it by, by um, computational physicists suggests that the sort of stuff, the resources you would need to run a simulation the size of our universe would entail a computer about the size of our universe. So um, you're not really gaining anything by saying this is a simulation. It does provide very little explanatory power. Um, so I don't know if that that helps and that makes sense. Um, some people take this so seriously that they're looking for glitches in the simulation that might provide evidence we live in a simulation. Um, I think they're gonna be disappointed um, because I think we live in reality instead, but it just puzzles me how people are prepared to accept this really wild idea, which is kind of equivalent to God, except with much less satisfaction and explanatory power which is kind of weird but that's how some people are we're a few minutes past uh, 7 30 i think let's uh, let's end it there because it also gives us a chance um to try this again i think this really worked very well and uh, again for which we hugely thank you phil for doing this it's a pleasure and, yeah to all of us god bless see you next week <laughs>